Jehovah's Witnesses are notorious for coming up with what they call new light every five minutes. It basically means the governing body wants to change their doctrine and they need an excuse to do it because they told everybody God speaks to them and them alone. Anyways, they came up with some new light about babies of all things. Check this out. Sometimes you'll hear people say of a little baby, look at that little angel. But more accurate would be to say, look at that little enemy of God. Well then, that's something. Now, there's more context to this clip, and I'll play it in a second. But first, let's talk about why the concept of New Light makes no sense. And other times, they release notoriously ridiculous New Light. Let's get into it. New Light as a concept is ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense that they wouldn't have things operating exactly how God wanted to operate if he's talking to them directly. So they make up the New Light explanation when they want to change their beliefs. God revealed something new to them and they're changing the way the organization operates to account for it. When you think about it, the belief seems incompatible with the idea that God never changes. Why doesn't he just lay out all the information for them up front so they can do what he wants them to do in the first place? A governing body member actually left the religion completely in 1981, disassociated himself. Then he went on to write a book about how destructive the governing body is. It wasn't until that moment that the governing body decided that God gave them new light, saying the people who leave the religion of their own free will, called disassociation, should also be shunned, just like people who get kicked out or disfellowshipped. Why did God wait to tell the governing body until after one of them quit and wrote a book about it? Why did God ban organ transplants for over 10 years and then decide that organ transplants were okay? Why did God decide certain positions in the bedroom were a disfellowshipping offense in 1974, and then decide they weren't a disfellowshipping offense in 1978, and then decide they were again in 1983? Why'd they decide that taking blood transfusions, or even using a medicine that was developed using blood fractions, was a disfellowshipping offense, but then decide that God was okay with you taking medicine that was developed with blood fractions? Are we sure they're actually hearing God's voice and following his instructions? Instructions. The new light that this governing body member Stephen Lett came out with is just as bizarre, and it actually has potentially damning side effects. Listen to the whole thing and I'll explain why. Now if we think about it, we're not born as friends of God, because we're born as sinful offspring of Adam. Actually, if we think about it, we're born as enemies of God. Sometimes you'll hear people say of a little baby, look at that little angel. But more accurate would be to say, Look at that little enemy of God. At first glance, it just seems like a little weirdo overanalyzing the Bible, right? It's far beyond that. First, this guy is a governing body member, in charge of forming out doctrine for 8 million people. He's one of 8 people who are capable of turning the group from a destructive cult to a benign religion. All he'd have to do is say, God told me that you don't have to shun your family members anymore. But he chooses not to. Instead, he's narrowing the field. Here's why this new light is so significant. Jehovah's Witnesses have a weird timeline of events. They believe that there's going to be a great tribulation when the end comes bebopping along. The great tribulation's this period of time when Jehovah's Witnesses are targeted for destruction by the world governments. After the tribulation comes to a close, Armageddon starts. When Armageddon starts, the governing body members, along with the rest of the 144,000 anointed Jehovah's Witnesses, are going to be raptured to heaven, handed heaven swords, and sent back to take out any enemies of God. Anybody who dies in Armageddon will be dead forever. After Armageddon, there will be a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. Anybody who didn't have a chance to learn the truth, like people who died without ever hearing about Jehovah's Witnesses, will have a second chance. It'll be like the Garden of Eden 2.0. So here's the real question. Who are the enemies of God? Before we continue, I wanted to mention something. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, there's Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and stickers and stuff on there. You can also check out my Telltale Unfiltered YouTube channel. I go through full-length breakdowns of sermons from people like Greg Locke, Kent Hovind, and even Jehovah's Witnesses. We talk about it line by line. So if you want more content, that's a good place to get it. I live stream on Twitch every Tuesday and Thursday for 
from 11 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And I edit the breakdowns and upload to the Unfiltered channel. All links are in the description, as always. Anyways, back to Jehovah's Witnesses. With all that doctrinal context under our belt, who are the enemies of God that they believe will be destroyed in Armageddon? Sometimes you'll hear people say of a little baby, look at that little angel. But more accurate would be to say, look at that little enemy of God. The enemies of God are anybody who isn't baptized. Not just people who are critical of the religion, not just morally bad people in their eyes, but even people who are unfamiliar with the religion or haven't had the time to get baptized. I knew a kid when I was growing up who refused to get baptized. He attended every meeting and even knocked on doors with everybody else, but he never took the plunge. When I asked him about it, he said, you can't be disfellowshipped if you don't get baptized. I.e., doctrinally, they won't shun him if he never officially joins. He was kind of an outcast. Didn't really work with or hang out with other Jehovah's Witnesses very much as a result, but nobody ever formally shunned him. That's been a little loophole up to now. Don't get baptized, you probably won't be fully shunned, but that just changed. Now this was presented as new light. This is new information that Jehovah handed down to the congregations through the governing body. Did they consider the implications of the new light before announcing it? The children won't make it through Armageddon if they aren't baptized? I can't imagine they didn't. They've been getting more and more exclusive with who they think will make it through Armageddon for a while now. In 2019, they clarified their position that you won't make it through Armageddon if you aren't a door-knocking Jehovah's Witness. Let me introduce you to Tony Morris, another governing body member. So you just take a look, and this is the idea Jehovah's getting across at your hands, and you look at your hands now, uh, only God, as he looks at your hands in here and all those that are tied in, does he see blood there? The humans sitting next to you, they, they might have an idea because they know you well and you haven't been out in service in weeks. Well, guess what? Most likely God's seeing some blood all over your hands. Or they go totally inactive and we appeal to them, we try to help, but you cannot water down what God says here. If your hands are not clean because you've been out warning then they have blood on them, and you're going to lose your life. Not only are they raising qualifications to make it through Armageddon, but they're getting more urgent. They really want their members to think we're precariously perched on the precipice. It's going to happen any five minutes. So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly, the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. So what's the side effect of this new life? Believing Jehovah's Witnesses have one option. Get your kid baptized immediately. Make sure they're knocking on doors with you every week. If they aren't doing that, they absolutely will not make it through Armageddon. According to the governing body members, who, if you remember, are getting new light directly from God himself. Unfortunately for them, but fortunately for the kids, getting baptized is not an easy task. It takes a minimum of a year of hard work and study to qualify. They usually hold baptism services about three times a year. The youngest I've ever heard of anybody getting baptized was seven years old. Usually it's 12 to 14. But now Stephen Lett is saying you won't even make it through Armageddon unless you're baptized. It doesn't matter if you're a baby or not. The guy has the power to open the religion up and heal broken families. Instead, he's locking it down even further. He's making people rush to get their kids baptized as early as possible so they have no way out of the religion if they decide they don't want to be a part of it later. If you aren't disturbed yet, just wait. There's another side effect to this new light. It isn't just if you don't get get baptized, you won't make it through Armageddon. Let me show you what these people think of the enemies of God. This is Tony Morris again. And they will go out and look on the carcasses of the men who rebelled against me, for the worms on them will not die, and their fire will not be extinguished, and they will become something repulsive to all people. So the Isaiah prophecy book mentions that uh, if as this Jewish scholar suggests, Gehenna was used for the disposal of refuse and carcasses of those deemed unworthy of burial. Fire would be a suitable means of eliminating such refuse. Okay, that's 
kind of weird. He's talking about Gehenna here. He read a verse from the book of Isaiah, and if you notice, he used the Isaiah's prophecy book as a source. It was subtle, but it was there. So the Isaiah prophecy book mentions that uh, if, as this Jewish scholar suggests, Gehenna was used for the disposal of refuse. Now, I don't know if Gehenna was used to dispose of refuse or not. It seems reasonable, but I've learned not to trust a single word out of these people's mouths without further research. What I'm really focused on here is the fact that the book that he mentioned, Isaiah's Prophecy, was published by him. He oversaw the production and publication of that book. So he's kind of quoting himself as a source here. I mean, he wasn't the only one overseeing the writing process, but he at least signed off on it when it was done to say, this is governed body approved and officially inspired by God. This is a problem that the ex-governing body member Ray Franz mentioned in his book, Crisis of Conscience. When he left the religion and wrote the book about how corrupt the organization is, he specifically mentioned times when the governing body and the writing department used their own literature as sources rather than the Bible. Anyways, that's ultimately beside the point, but I found it interesting. He hasn't gotten to the worst part of his little talk here. Let's keep listening. What the fire did not consume, the maggots would. Now, I don't know if you know much about maggots, but uh, you see a whole bunch of them. It's just not a pleasant sight. But what a fitting picture of the final end of all of God's enemies. That's right. That's what he was leading up to. They believe that God's enemies will be thrown into the trash heap, and he seems to be happy about it. And who are God's enemies? Sometimes you'll hear people say of a little baby, look at that little angel. But more accurate would be to say, look at that little enemy of God. Keep listening to what Tony Morris has to say about the enemies of God, because it gets worse, if you can believe it. The apostates and the enemies of Jehovah would say, well, that's gruesome, that's despicable. You teach your people these things? No, God teaches his people these things. This is what he's foretelling. And frankly, for friends of Jehovah God, how reassuring that... They're finally going to be gone. All these despicable enemies that have uh, just reproached Jehovah's name, destroyed, never, ever to live again. Now, it's not that we rejoice in someone's death, but when it comes to God's enemies, finally. Actually, that's exactly what you're doing, rejoicing in someone's death. I don't know how else to interpret that. If that's not what you're doing, then what are you doing? What do you mean by this? I thought you were pretty clear. Keep listening. Now, it's not that we rejoice in someone's death, but when it comes to God's enemies, finally, they're out of the way, especially these despicable apostates who at one point had dedicated their life to God, and then they joined forces with Satan, the devil, the chief apostate of, of all time. Did you catch what he said there? He can't wait for God's enemies to be destroyed, especially the apostates. So the original sentiment wasn't about apostates. His sentiment was about people who aren't baptized. For those who might be unfamiliar, when they talk about apostates, they mean people who are critical of the religion. Not just ex-members, but anybody who has a problem with the way things run. I'll get to that in a second. Watch the end of this clip. So, in conclusion, let's go back to that opening psalm that we looked at here. But the wicked will perish, the enemies of Jehovah will vanish like glorious pastures. Particularly, they will vanish like smoke. So, this, I thought this would be a nice memory aid, to this verse stay in the mind. Here's what Jehovah's promising. Okay. as Jehovah's enemies. They're gonna vanish like smoke. If that doesn't make it clear exactly how they view enemies of God, apparently including but not limited to apostates, according to Stephen Lett's new light, I don't know what will. But their position on apostates isn't new. They've been railing against apostates for years. They literally believe that apostates are mentally diseased. The Watchtower from July 15th, 2011 says, apostates are mentally diseased and they seek to infect others with their disloyal teachings. Jehovah, the great physician, tells us to avoid contact with them. We know what he means, but are we determined to heed his warnings in all respects? In other words, don't talk to apostates. Don't look at them. Don't even give them the time of day. Don't communicate with them at all 
all because they're mentally diseased and they could infect you if you let them in. And this is exactly how Jehovah's Witnesses view it. If I see an old Jehovah's Witness I grew up with, they won't even look at me. They'll face anywhere but in my direction. If I asked what time it was, they wouldn't even acknowledge that I was standing there. I'm like a ghost. This is the type of perspective they take when talking about anybody who disagrees with them. They're sick. And it's this perspective that got the religion labeled as an extremist organization and banned from Russia. Of course, this article about being mentally diseased came out in 2011, and the court cases that eventually got them fully banned in the country started happening in 2009. But they've held this perspective for a long, long time. Since I was little, the Russian judge that banned the religion said they incite hatred by propagating the exclusivity and supremacy of their religious beliefs. It goes beyond standard Christian denominations who just think they have the right religion and everybody else is wrong. They're mandated to mistreat people. If they don't comply, if they talk to people who are critical of their religion, they're putting themselves at risk of being shunned and hated by their own friends and family members. I've lost a lot because I didn't want to be a part of the religion anymore. I lost connection with everybody I knew or loved since I was a little kid. My best friend, Sean, won't even talk to me anymore. I haven't talked to him in 12 years. I haven't had a relationship with my mom in about as long. But despite that, I'm proud to wear the badge of honor they call apostate. Check out the etymology of the word. From ecclesiastical Latin apostata, from Greek apostates, deserter or runaway slave. I'll wear the badge of runaway slave with pride. They have done untold damage, not just to my life, but to tens of thousands of other people's lives. And instead of turning the car around and reversing course, instead of making things better, they just decided to do even more damage. They decided to dive even deeper into extremism. The baby thing is bizarre and amusing, but it has serious doctrinal implications. If you aren't a baptized, door-knocking Jehovah's Witness, they hate you. Jehovah's Witnesses just held a big annual convention recently, and they said some unhinged crazy stuff there. They released the videos of what they said to their website, which is where I found that clip of Stephen Lett going nuts about God-hating babies. If you want to see the sermons in their entirety, come over to my Twitch. I'll be going through the whole thing beginning to end on Tuesday and Thursday this week at 11 a.m. If you missed it, I'll be uploading the full breakdown on my Telltale Unfiltered channel, so check there to see if it's already uploaded. It's going to be wild. All links are in the description, as always. Okay? That's all I've got for you. Thanks for watching, guys.